Welcome to the October Gallery Talk. Uh, this month, we have a truly special privilege and experience. Uh, we hear from Patty Warashina. For anyone familiar either with the Northwest Pacific art world or the war wider international ceramics world, that's about all I have to say. Over a long career, she has achieved regional, national, and international acclaim with accomplishments, awards, and honorary titles too numerous to mention. As those awards suggest, skillful ceramics are just one aspect of what she has created. The marvelous pieces for which she is known give us entry into unique worlds of her own making, people by charming and curiosity provo provoking figures and objects. Her ceramics suggest intriguing experiences and stories with deeper meanings. They charm us and delight us, they make us think. And she was going to do the same, I can tell you already, having just met her a few minutes ago and being charmed myself by the spontaneous conversation we've had. Anyway, all she has done is quite an accomplishment and she spent a long career doing it again and again. We are honored and delighted to have her here to speak. She came for a reunion of old friends. We thank them for extending the invitation to her to conclude that visit with this artist's talk to us. And we thank her for our gracious agreement and her sense of humor. She did tell me I could just read the slides and she could sit down. <laughs> but I don't think we'll do it that way. Uh, so please welcome Patty Warishi. Thanks so much for having me uh, come and speak. And I've heard so much about Horizon House in the past. And I'm so impressed with the art collection here. I just walking down the hall and go, wow. You know? <laughs> and um, also, uh, another special thing for me to be here is because I have three uh, friends here who I graduated from Lewis and Clark College, or Lewis and Clark High School in Spokane uh, in our senior year in 1902. <laughs> and so it's really neat to be able to, you know, see an old friend, you know, old friends, you know, from from uh, your high school era. So uh, thank you so much for having me. So um, uh, I'm going to uh, speak. Uh, it's pretty much of a survey of of my life uh, in the ceramic area. And um, uh, let's see, I better put the first slide on. I'm trying to figure out how. To work these things. Um, I live over by Lake Union, just off Lake Union, and um, uh, it's close to the university. Uh, I taught at the university for oh, like 30 years, and I taught in the Midwest for another three years. And um, I, um, when Bob, my husband, Bob Sperry, and I got together um, uh, over a time, he says, let's, Pat, let's bu build a studio. And so he says, where do you want to live? And I said, oh, let's go down by Lake Union, uh, where my old stomping grounds when I was a student. Um, and I lived um, in about four shacks along there. And, and so uh, sh uh, fortunately, at that time, everybody wanted to live over in Lake Washington. So we, got, we looked for two years around Lake Union and finally found the spot that's overlooking the, the water. And um, uh, so anyway... Um, this is my husband, Bob Sperry, who passed away about 26 years ago. And um, this is uh, in, in part of his studio. And he was uh, w uh, fairly well known in, in the Seattle area. Um, he did a lot of stoneware work and um, a lot of murals, a lot of these big ceramic murals. And um, he was a, a really funny guy. He was great. I, I had a wonderful life with him. And um, he raised my daughters, two daughters. And uh, he's um, stretching here. <laughs> uh, and um, my influences, you know, I got, when I came to the university, I, my, uh, I was telling somebody earlier that um, I lived in Spokane, grew up in Spokane, and in our family, my, my dad was a dentist, and being Asian, um, they really kind of encouraged you to go into sciences because they wanted you to eat later on in life. And so I had my, my sister is eight years older, and she became a, a medical technologist, and my brother was supposed to be a dentist or a doctor, and I was supposed to be, um, and, it, and I was going to go into, my sister said, going to be a dental hygienist. And um, so that's what I had in mind when I came to the university. And um, I had one elective that I had to take outside of my program area. 
and they put me in a drawing class. And John Constantine's, uh, Adele Constantine, uh, father, John Constantine, was an art a painter at that time. He was a master student. And I took this drawing class from him, and I had never taken any art classes before, and if I fell in love with it immediately. And, um, and so I kept taking more drawing class, or not more classes, you know, foundation classes. And one day my advisor says, Pat, admit it, switch over. <laughs> so I switched over to the art, art school. And um, I, I fell in love with ceramics very by accident. I, I'm, I was walking down the hall and I saw this room at the end of the T in the art school. And they were throwing, and I'd walk in there and I'd watch them throw, and I thought, oh, God, that looks like fun. And, and so I used to go in there and watch them, and finally I ended up taking these beginning foundation classes. And, um, and throwing was very, very um, uh, seductive. And I would stay up, I'd stay all night trying to learn how to control this clay. And that's how I got into it, it was through the throwing. Um, anyway, after a while, I started finding out more and more about ceramics, and there's this guy from the Bay Area. His name is Peter Volkus. He was originally from Montana in the 50s, and uh, eventually uh, went down to California, and actually back east. This is during the abstract expressionist era, and uh, he ended up at Berkeley. But before this time, you know, he was a huge impact on ceramics, I mean, even all over the world. He really changed the experimental work that is being done now, right now, in all over the world. I, I mean, I really truly believe that because everything was pretty traditional and pretty pretty tame. Um, There's a lot of throwing, uh, a lot of pottery being done um, on the East Coast, but Volkus, you know, he treated the clay like it was uh, like paint. And um, so, and then he got into these massive pieces, which was very unusual at this time. Um, and um, so, this is him. He also uh, gathered a huge following of of male uh, potters. Um, he had this entourage of, you know, like one time I was down in Berkeley, and um, uh, oh, I'm getting it. <laughs> That's, I uh, somebody took me over to. He said, "Well, let's go see Pete." So we went over. And uh, he was in his, um, his office, and I, I went through the door, and he says, well, sit down, you know, and he had about three guys sitting along the wall on the floor, you know, uh, paying homage to him. I mean, this is pretty typical of him. You know, it's a, you know, really macho guy. And so he says, hey, he says, it was Marvin Leposky took me over. And, and so he, uh, Pete goes, he pulls the bottom drawer, and he says, you want a drink? <laughs> he says, okay. <laughs> anyway, this is the kind of things that was happening during this time. So it's an extremely macho time. And so there was a big uh, a following of, of this man from all over the United States. Um, so this is kind of where I got into throwing. I wanted to control. This is porcelain. It's about that wide. It's a sphere. And um, at this time, this is kind of toward the end. I... Um, I was taking uh, classes um, all the way through, um, and in my, you know, in my junior senior year, um, Bob Bob Sperry was my teacher, and Bob used to say, "You cannot just dip in a glaze. There's no way. You got to decorate it." And he's encouraged us to take a lot of painting. So I took a lot of painting um, at the U. I took Walden Mason, various people down the hall. <laughs> and um, anyway, I fell in love with uh, Arshil Gorky and. Uh, and and I, at that time, people would say, "You gotta, you gotta learn how to throw a brushstroke." You know, like because um, the uh, Minge pottery from Japan was really, really popular all over the United States. You know, Shoji Hamada and people like that. I was so lucky that Shoji Hamada came to the university for a quarter, and I was able to work with Shoji. And um, uh, so I was, I mean, I had such wonderful people to work with. Um, but anyway, so you can see the kind of um, um, influence like Gorky had on me on these particular pieces. Um, uh, and um, so I took a lot of painting, and, um, and anyway, this is what was happening at this time. Um, but also, Bob used to make us uh, throw, um, he used to encourage a lot of experimental work. So you can't just, you know, you can throw pots, that's one thing, but you gotta, you know, take some risk. So anyway, these were some machine sculptures I did. They're about five feet tall. 
and they come apart in sections. And I was very much influenced by Louise Nevelson in New York City. And um, so, um, so this, you can see the horrible th pieces I made. <laughs> and um, later on, you know, this is, this uh, changes, uh, the, the art scene's starting to change in ceramics. And um, down in the Bay Area, there was the funk movement. And uh, it was, um, you know, Volkus was in that abstract expressionist period. But then Arneson, kind of the same age group, Arneson came along. He was at Mills College, uh, I think he graduated from Mills College with uh, Antonio Prieto. Um, uh, but anyway, um, Arneson was kind of a, a really crazy guy too. And he ended up at Davis and he, there was a, a many artists in that area that were influencing each other, not only in ceramics, but painting and sculpture. They were all kind of friends. And, and so you got this certain kind of feeling about this work is changing, you know, it's no longer abstract. They're using these kind of uh, literal images that are starting to appear, but not just literal images. They're, there's always something kind of weird about them or strange or humorous or something kind of irreverent. And, um, and I love this era. This is probably what influenced me more than anything. Um, and it was Bay, uh, Bay Area, and also uh, in Chicago, there was a movement called the Chicago Harry Who. And if you look them up, they were also very, very uh, incredible artists. So um, also, you know, I had other uh, influences too, Magritte. And uh, this is a piece, this is a piece early on. Um, I was you know, still learning how to control this material. And um, this piece is about three feet high, and it's a floor vase. And um, uh, what I was thinking of at this time, I didn't know anything about these colors that were done in glazes at this time. And I had this inkling that I just needed to get these images out. So instead of using glaze, because I, I didn't know anything about these, quote, low fire glazes, um, I, I painted it with uh, uh, acrylic, uh, acrylic paints. Um, and this one, um, called Arm and Hammer. So this is, um, and this is the first car image that appears on some of my work early on. Um, and this um, piece also, I'm still learning how to control this material. These are about two and a half feet long, um, and it's, you're looking down on it. And it, I call it the bread loaf series. And you're looking down at this giant mouth, and the tongue actually is a lid. It lifts off. And um, I had, at this particular period in time, I had found out that there was this, uh, uh, it was Duncan, uh, see, Dobie Depot was on Westlake. And it was a place where women, uh, old lady women, potter, not potters, but ceramic people would go and buy china paints. And we'd china paint on these porcelain plates. And I had found out about this. And um, they were using these commercial glazes. And you know, at, at University or around the around the United States, you just didn't buy commercial glazes. I mean, that was like that was hobby, and <laughs> but you know when when uh, the first person that I ever saw use these low fire glazes was uh, Peter Volkus. I had opened an American uh, craft magazine up one day, and I opened it up, and Volkus had done this giant pot, and the the arm had broken off of it, and he had put this. Uh, luster on it, a gold luster. And um, it was the first time I'd ever seen anybody use a commercial product on their stoneware made glazes. And that kind of jarred me. So all of a sudden, I, I, I discovered this, this, this material. I ran down to Dobie Depot, and I bought all these different colored glazes and uh, took them home, I'm about a dozen jars, and tried them all out. And so this was kind of the very, kind of the beginning of, of my uh, experiments. And these things, uh, these uh, bread loaf series started to go one on top of another. So I, uh, they're, they're compounded one on top of another. And this is called Moondog Dream. And um, so also I'm learning how, again, it's a covered piece, and I'm learning how to control the material. Um, um, and also you see on here, these are all colored glazes, uh, commercial, and also uh, lusters, which is a platinum luster, which you see the silver. Uh, that's all commercial. So I switched, and I never left. <laughs> okay, and then um, 
I um, started playing around. These are about three feet tall. They're, I call them Women Altar Series. Um, and this is, you captured my heart. And what I did was I did the graphite drawings to the left and um, to scale. And then once I did the drawings, um, I would transfer them over to ceramic on the right-hand side. But if you notice on the, on the left-hand side, you see the, it's, it's done in, in flat, except for a few things like the obi, and her face is done in relief. And then her arms come out three-dimensionally. She's holding a, um, a, a heart. Uh, you captured my heart. Um, I'm kind of jumping around, but uh, we're skipping. Um, I usually go through series of work, and usually the series usually has about maybe anywhere from 12 to 15 pieces. And in this particular series, um, I decided to do uh, kills, uh, take a whole uh, the subject matter of kills. And one of the reasons why was during this particular time, women uh, that were in ceramics really weren't um, invited to come in and um, talk about kills or how to build them. You know, it was really a kind of a guy thing. You know, they used to get together and we'll talk about burners and blah, blah, blah. And um, so I decided I was going to do this series, and it was my series, which uh, was taking off on this whole idea of kills and the way I would design it. And this is uh, kills uh, with plumbing. And so in order to f make your kill fire evenly, I had these these pipes going in and out of the kill all over the place. So it's kind of an exaggeration of an idea. Um, and this one is called Metamorphosis of a Car Kill. And in ceramics, um, there's a, we call it a car kill. What it is is a stationary kill, brick kill. And then you have a cart in front of you. You load it up with ware, with shelves, et cetera. And then you shove it in a, on the track, and you shove it into the kill, and that's called a car kill. So this was my version of a car kill. And this is about, I would say, 30 inches long. I did about 14 cars, I think, all together. And so that's why you see the flames coming out of it. Um, this is called the clothesline robbery, and I'm starting to get out of the kill series. And um, I decided to to do this piece, and um, I was I had ne I had never taken any figure classes at the university. You know, I never took in sculpture. I had George Sakao, I had Everett Dupin, I had um, let's see who else was, um, but I never I never. Uh, Took any, I took basic um, sculpture, but never a figure. And so I had this car, and I thought, well, I'll make a figure to go inside of it. I want to make it to scale, because I had done about, I don't know how many cars I'd done. And I thought, well, I need to make a figure to go inside of it. So that's how these figures ended up to be the size. They're about uh, 10, 10 inches high, the figures. And um, this particular one is called the Clothesline Robbery. And the image came about because when I was in high school, I remember meeting a guy from California. And in Spokane, when you live in Spokane, anybody from California is like, wow, you know, this guy's really got it together. And I remember talking to this guy, and I said, well, let me show, you, show me a picture of your girlfriend. So he pulls out this wallet, and he pulls this picture out, and there's this girl sitting on the hood of a car. Well, when I, when I started doing this car, I, I remembered that image. And so that's how this, this came about, this particular. So um, this, um, so anyway, then I, I got kind of excited about doing that figure. So then I started taking off on this whole idea about these figures. And um, this is called Born to Be, and it's a, a timepiece. So it's breaking out of this chrysalis. And in this particular case, I wanted to make it look like it was 20th century. So instead of making her having a moth wing, I decided to put airplane wings on her because I wanted to bring it up to date. <laughs> um, this is called Who Said I Couldn't Fly? Um, this one's called Forbidden Fruit. And what this is is... Um, I was thinking of uh, the, the tree of life in the, in the middle, and I'm, I'm still drinking martinis. <laughs> so what this tree of life is, is uh, an olive tree. 
and it's a martini yellow tree. And inside um, are these figures. They're pulling things off the tree. And um, so at this particular time, you know, I, was, I, I started using friends of mine, like Mary uh, is a really dear friend of mine, and my kids. I started using their faces because it's really hard to make up faces, you know, like all these faces. So I started to use, started to use real people I knew. And what they're doing is they're running around this piece, this, this uh, sphere, and they're trying to get in, into this, this tree of life uh, paradise. And at the bottom of this tree, there's flames. Um, and in this one, it's called the glass cage. And um, so these, these women are climbing up this, this, this stock and trying to break out of it. And when I went down to the company, the plastic company, uh, I told the guy down there, I said, you know, when you put this thing together, don't put the lid on it. Just bring it out and just make sure you don't glue it down. So he brought it out, and I brought it to give a hammer, and I started breaking, and he, he thought I was crazy. And I said, just glue it on. <laughs> anyway, so this one's called the glass cage, and they're breaking out. Um, I started doing um, also, um, uh, I started doing these different, like I did the the cars, and then I said, well, I haven't done boats, so this is, this will be a boat piece. And so I did a series of boats, and this one is called um, Red River Run. And what I was thinking about at this time was, you know, Hanford and the Columbia River. And um, you know how Hanford at that time where they were, you know, producing all this stuff. And, and so what you see here is you see this, this fish, you know, salmon or whatever, and it is actually... Um, the inside, uh, not the fish itself, but the inside of the boat is glowing. And I put uh, neon paint in it. And, and when you put it by the window, it just like it looks like it's burning out. It's really neat the way that paint works. But the rest is all, all ceramic and glaze. OK. Um, and when I was working on these uh, figures, um, you know, I did a whole series of these three-dimensional th freestanding sculptures and I decided well, I want to do a series on a wall. So this one uh, was called the nursery and I started thinking about that this is about uh, I would say about four and a half feet by four and a half feet by about six inches deep and I started thinking about you know this isn't too too um, uh, it's not too unusual you know when you think about our society you know the strategic strategic air command and rocket de, de Gibraltar and, and the mines that people go into, you know, there's all these underground ways of, of people living. And so this is my interpretation of uh, underground living called the nursery. And uh, this is above ground. It's called uh, Tableware Fiesta. Um, and I got a commission through the city to do a, a large piece. And so I did this piece, uh, and at this time it was in the Opera House. It's an importable works collection. I think it ended up at the convention center. But um, I uh, decided to do this piece, and, I, and at this particular time, in 86, um, Seattle was really opening up to the arts. You know, there was a lot of uh, music and a lot of painting and, I mean, a lot of art galleries, and it was kind of exploding. It was a very... Uh, interesting time. So I decided that what I was going to do is going to do a celebration. And what you see here is um, uh, Ming, uh, a Ming Dynasty bridge. And what it is is half of an eye. So I was trying to celebrate the uh, reflection would make a complete eye. And it was celebrating the visual arts. So all these people, instead of me trying to make up 72 figures, I used people that I knew in the art world. And um, so what I did was I took, um, would go to their house and I'd take 15 photographs with Polaroid each of each, fo uh, each uh, artist and um, I'd do four versions of their head and I'd do the, their bodies, different positions and then I'd also do them doing some kind of movement. Now, George Sakawa, you know, being older, he was just sitting. <laughs> so, um, so these are various people that I know that like if you're a jeweler you would be working with the stones at the bottom. And if you're a filmmaker, then you'd be having film. That's Roger Schreiber. And uh, um, the reason I'm showing you this particular piece is because uh, that's Michael Fagin's that has that running leg. And it was a clue to where my work was going to go to in the future. I, there was something that I was fascinated. I wanted my work to change. 
I wanted it to kind of talk about the contemporary society we were living in. And so that, that piece of Michael Fagin with his ba baby um, was kind of a key piece for me, or a key figure. And Jake Lawrence is in there somewhere. There's Francis Chilantano and Alden Mason, Lane Goldsmith. And um, after this project was over, I got burned out. I mean, it, was, it took me about a year and a half to do. And I, I just got totally burned out. And I wanted to jump, jump I had to do something different. So I, I jumped scale. And these pieces uh, were three feet high. And you notice how they're getting modified now. And that was from that Michael Fajan piece. And um, this is called Band-Aid Man. And what I was thinking about in this particular piece was uh, down in the Southwest, you know, you have uh, all these santos and uh, all these Christ figures with all the these cuts on his, his body. And so in this case, I was uh, covering them up with Band-Aids. Um, that wasn't exciting enough for me. So what I did was I jump scale again. And um, so these were pieces. Uh, I did this whole series of these heads. And they're covered jars. Actually, they're lidded. They all come apart. Um, and um, they were kind of suggestions on where I could go next. And um, so they're about two and a half feet high. They're about that big. And they have lids. And um, they're all glazed, low, low fire. And um, this is what happened. They, I blew them up you know, so in scale so that, you know, they were all done in sections. And uh, um, so that's what, that was my challenge. Um, and then, um, so these are all, all low temperature glazes. And um, you can see what I did. And um, this is called White Lightning. And um, she's what she's doing. She's looking at, at her back. You know, I was thinking of the Middle East. And she's running away kind of from, from something like war. And she's got a chemical flask in her hand. And this is called White Cap. It's about four feet high. Um, this is at the convention center at Maidenbauer Center and called Mercurial Miss. And um, I was thinking about... Um, Mercury, the, the uh, god of uh, commerce. And I decided that I was going to do a female version because women do the shopping. And they spend the money. And they keep the economy going. So I was going to do my, my version, which is the mercurial mess. And um, so this is the way it turned out. And so you see she has the wings in the back, painted on the background. And, um, and then she has a snake in the back that she's holding. And so this is the outcome. Um, and also, instead of ho holding a coin, she's holding a credit card. <laughs> um, these then when when I started jumping scale like that, then you know you want to start changing again, right? So <laughs> I start dropping back down in scale, and uh, these are about you know five feet total. Um, and uh, this is a, called "Come to Mama." This is Achilles' baptism in the River Styx. Um, and I'm, uh, <laughs> I love plants. My mother, my grandmother were incredible gardeners. And, um, and I've always had this kind of love for plants. And so these are kind of um, things that I grew, like this lotus was in my pond upstairs. And um, then you see this poppy. <laughs> that uh, I like outrageous things. And um, so I'm showing you these. And so I did, I did a series of paintings. These are big watercolors. And um, they're, I, I think they're, this is probably the scale right here on the wall. And um, this is called Genesis. And what I was thinking of was um, I was thinking of uh, this um, scientist that's coming through this uh, ring, this uh, ring, and then and out of, jumping out of a helicopter, and then all these varieties of plants, uh, hybrids that are, that are uh, being um, uh, invented or being propagated. And um, I had a, a lemon tree that was out on my deck, and it had broken off. And, um, and I saw it, and I pushed it back on, and I 
taped it up, and it healed. <laughs> so that's, that was just kind of another, uh, that actually happened. So um, this one's uh, called Redwood Rift, and it's a large painting also. And uh, I had this show down in Texas, and I think it was Texas, I can't remember, I think. And um, they had asked me to ship these large-scale pieces, ceramic pieces down. And I said, well, you know, you better watch it because, you know, shipping's going to kill you. And so they said, well, why don't you send us like five large-scale pieces, and then you can fill the walls with whatever. So I, that's what, this is how these paintings came about. And, um, and they were all watercolor. And um, this one is um, called Redwood Drift. And what she's doing is, you know, when you go to the Catholic church, you know, they always take the little... Uh, offerings and they hang them on the side of the altar and that's what these these uh, leaves represent um, and um, this is um, called souls at war and uh, I was down in Mexico City and that's me it's a kind of a self-portrait you know how a long time ago when you look in the comic books you know they they always had Black was always had green highlights, so I just painted the the highlight, <laughs> a chopstick in my hair, and then this is me down in the, uh, Mexico City at the there was a, a plaza as I recall, and they were and what this represents is the, all the people that were selling things, and um, but also in this in this venue or this particular painting, um, I was also thinking about politics, and so you see the um, elephant. And um, you see this kind of crazy, the uh, all these kind of crazy things. So it's it's kind of a political mixture of of things that um, I threw into this called Souls at War. Um, these these figures or this particular uh, figure uh, or portrait, it was actually a large scale piece too. It's it's about I would say two and a half feet tall, and um, I was went to Rome. I had actually uh, taught there for a quarter, and just running around Rome was amazing to see all these beautiful sc sculptures. And so when I got back, I did this particular piece. And um, what you see uh, here with her, her uh, braids are the you know on the columns on the columns in the in, in Rome you see these scrolls. And so what I was doing was emulating the scrolls that I saw in the columns in Italy. Uh, with her hair. This is called Real Politique. Um, and uh, what it is, is um, my dog, I had a poodle at one point, and um, it was kind of a laugh at politics. And um, it's all the things, the strange things that happen in, in our society. And so the ringleader was actually my dog, Mikey. And he's sitting there in the metal with a stick in his hand or in his mouth and um, what you see are these figures and uh, they what they represent is that like this fellow in the front with a tower that represents the uh, Japanese uh, uh, concentration camps during the war and um, he's got a flashlight in his hand and then he's got a cigar and he's watching you know over the camp and so each one of these like the woman on the right uh, which is the woman below the water, um, actually is kind of nature, and, she, and, and these wooden ducks on top, like nature is now becoming a wooden duck. And then the man with the barbells, what that is, is um, uh, it's, it's called the strong man. And strong man actually is holding um, barbells, but if you look, if you go close to it, you'll see they're bombs. And then the figure on the left, is a figure with these airplanes like flying around. Um, so these uh, pieces got fairly large. And um, this one, uh, they're called the Milepost Queens. And they were kind of taken from a trip that I went to Egypt. I went down um, the Nile. And I saw these fabulous figures, you know, by the, uh, outside the, uh, the, the area where they would have these upright figures. And so this is kind of a takeoff on, on my feelings about what I saw. Um, there are some prints, a few prints that I did. It's called Red Eyes. And um, this is um, 
after Bob died. And so it's me, a self-portrait, and Bob going up to heaven, hopefully. <laughs> and, uh, and the rain uh, umbrella is on the right. And uh, the figure on the, let's see. The other one, the other one's called Hooked on Subs, and she's sitting there fishing, and what she's getting out of there are our submarines. And in the back in the corner, on the upper left-hand corner, she's looking out a window, and you see the warships that are going by. Um, also, I did a, a series of sock assets, and this is a, uh, uh, so what you see here are, are the, the pouring va vessels, and she's the, Ewer, and then all the coins you flip over, and they're the cups. And this one, uh, this is a political piece, and it's called Oil Slick. And this was George Bush at that time, and I think it was Earl Warren. Uh, let's see, what was this? Uh, anyway, <laughs> and the oil drums. And he's a Ewer, so you can see where you can put the sake into, and it comes out this his feet, and on, on the other, other figure, you can see it comes out of his hands. Um, I, I started jump changing again, and, and what I did was, in, you know, I'm thinking about living in contemporary times, and so my figures, I've been trying and trying over the years to try to get the feeling of, of living in contemporary times and not going back to, to uh, say, Renaissance or something in reality. So I wanted to make my figures more modified and um, so this is uh, kind of where I ended up uh, with my figures. And I was thinking of these things as, you know, like um, uh, spatially, you know, uh, um, colored uh, sheets uh, passing over the figure and then hitting them in various places to um, uh, clothe them. Um, this is a piece that I did down in Portland on the street. It's bronze. It's called City Reflections. Um, and this one's called Bo Gossip Monger, and it's about, I would say this ring is about five feet across. And um, what I was thinking of in this is, it's kind of like um, uh, our computers and how dangerous, you know, technology is. And um, so what you see here is there's two figures kind of talking, and as the figures go around, they start to get it in red, and they're passing gossip. And um, I tried to simplify this idea by using when we were little kids, we used to have cans with, uh, that we used to play telephone with. And so I simplified this idea of communication. And as it works around, um, you'll see that um, they get more and more gossipy. And what happens as it starts to get red, um, they are starting to get heated. And the last one, the, the cans now become bombs. And so it's my interpretation of, of technology um, in a simplified version. Um, this one's called Look Ma, No Hands, and um, it's on a steel stand and uh, feathered harassment. This is kind of ma ma magic fly zone. Um, passage through Venetian light. This one was uh, actually kind of sitting in my couch and, uh, and I was reading the paper and I just happened to be looking and all of a sudden the sun was coming through and hitting, hitting the newspapers and I, I thought, wow, wow, those are beautiful lines, you know, this uh, coming through the Venetian blinds. And so I, I, I thought about this and I ran down my studio and I, I, I didn't knock this out, but anyway, that's how the uh, idea came about. And so what you see, uh, this one's called Passage Through Venetian Light and that's how it, and what I was thinking about this particular piece is kind of the shape of an hourglass, and that means time. And I'm thinking about probably my own passage of time. In other words, you start out and then you go through, and hopefully you go up, <laughs> not down. Um, and uh, so the figures start becoming like birds. And this is called scrutiny. This is uh, kind of how I feel right now. <laughs> you know, when you, let's say, you go to a gallery and you walk in and you don't know anybody. And, um, and they very, everybody starts sizing you up. So you're, the, you're standing on the X down here and people are starting to look at you. And so this is why this piece comes about. It's about five feet long. 
and this is called Rapture. Um, this was actually instigated by my mother. She was um, on her, uh, you know, she was dying. She was at home, and she was in bed, and um, she, my mother was a very quiet woman. She never talked about religion, but she's religious, you know. She used to go to the Methodist Church in Spokane, and she had this, um, uh, uh, I think it was a cross that was on the other side of the, her bedroom on a, on a dresser, on a uh, uh, drawer, dresser drawer. And it was up there, and she kept looking at it, and she was lying on her back, and she kept looking at it. And so one day, I took it, and I took the, this, this uh, amulet, and I put it on the ceiling. I hung it from the ceiling so she didn't have to look this way. She could look up. And so this one's called Rapture, and this is uh, the idea behind this piece. This is called Lunar Lunacy, and um, it's like all the phases of the moon and uh, things that were happening up there. Um, this is called Assisted Living. <laughs> uh, uh, this is, I didn't mean to bring this here. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so you see the two fingers on either side. And this was called Beneath the Lotus. And this is called Brainstorm. Uh, this actually has a laser light in it, and it starts to flash uh, different colors, and uh, it's in the head. And this is uh, a, a takeoff. It's called Censored. Hear no evil, speak no evil, and see no evil. Uh, this is called female uh, Feline uh, Apparition, and it's a uh, glass and ceramics. Gaffer girl, and anybody, uh, a gaffer, for people in, in, in glass, it's the person who's uh, blowing the, the glass. And this is called Life in a Bubble. This is called Cat Box. And um, this was actually uh, Stefano uh, Car uh, Catal Catalani. Uh, anyway, he's, he was at the Bellevue Art Museum, and he asked this woman who had a collection of over 100 uh, uh, Neko cats from Japan, and he had, had them, uh, her, an exhibition of them. And in, in Seattle, he had asked about maybe 10 people to do their version of a Neko. So this was my version, They're about three feet tall, and uh, the heads move. And they're storage jars. Um, this is a piece that I um, kind of, it's called A Pussy in Disguise, and uh, anyway, I won't, I won't tell you the details on this, but anyway, he's uh, got his hand uh, on, a, on a newspaper uh, suppression of the uh, press. Anyway, I don't think I have to go through any more discussion on this guy. Um, and he's got um, cat hairs that are on his sleeve that are stripes. Uh, which can also be other sy sy symbols of our life. Um, I did this uh, piece, this is called Crossroads, um, and what it is is I was thinking about our society, you know, what, what our history, right now, historically, what, what's happening, everything's going nuts. And um, so this is uh, Trump in the front, and some of the things that are happening in our world. Um, and and uh, so this is kind of a cloud-based piece, you know, I was thinking of the Internet and things like that. I think it's self-explanatory. <laughs> uh, and I, uh, you know, when this all this crisis happened several years ago, you know, I, I just started doing some drawings. So uh, this is uh, 2020, the year of hell on earth. And so I just started doing these sketches. Um, and this is me in my house. <laughs> toilet paper. <laughs> Hoarding toilet paper. <laughs>
Um, also, you know, I've taken a, quite a few trips to Asia, and um, this is a, a, I think this was in India, um, and I was so impressed. You know, you go into these caves, they're just fabulous, these monumental sculptures that are just, you know, to die for. And um, you're just really humbled when you st see things like this. And um, so a lot of this stuff also influenced me. And um, so this is uh, a piece that I uh, did for this in South Lake Union right now. Um, uh, and um, what's it called? it's called Dreamer. <laughs> I can't even remember the name. <laughs> Dreamer. And so this is, uh, it was cast aluminum. And um, the reason why I used cast aluminum, I could have used bronze, but I decided to use aluminum because I could make it look more like my ceramics. So it's on... Um, Westlake and Republican. And uh, since that time, you know, I've been working on this. This is actually done at the Traver Show. And um, this is called Explosive Situation, Wild Blue Yonder. And it talks about, you know, what's happening. It's, uh, the, the, it's called, the show's called The World Upside Down. Double Trouble. Throw the dice, weight of the world, back scratch, um, space play, burp. <laughs> and um, these are, you know, I had that, I don't know, I you go back to my s throwing roots, you know, like uh, utilitarian roots, and so these, they made these jars. Somehow I don't fit in. Catfish. Fish in hot water. Adrift in the blue. I wish there was some distance between us. It's a covered jar also, two of them. Kaching with red ball. Harmony, and this is a, a model that is being, right now, being constructed. It's going to be about 15 feet high, and it's for a, a PBS station um, down in uh, Trump's area. <laughs> uh, that's the end. I can't answer it. <laughs> How do you fire those large pieces and also the small, intricate ones? How do you do it? Carefully. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, what I do is when I'm doing those really large scale pieces, I always build a model. And then I know the size of my kills. I mean, I have certain ki size kills that I can use. And so I have to measure, make sure that I can measure to make things fit. Uh, you know, so I, I divide the model up, and then I could see, you know, this is going to be 30 inches high, this is going to be 40 inches high, this is going to be 28 inches wide, so I know it's going to fit in the kill. Patty? Uh-huh. Can you hear me? Uh-huh. Okay. Uh, for, for many years, in the old opera house, before the remodel and the changes as we know it today, you had a huge thing. It was all white. It was hundreds of little intricate. Yeah, that's that one, the bridge piece. Yeah. Oh, that. That's the same one. Oh, it's the same yeah. one. Yeah. Okay. All right. <laughs> I won't do another one of those. Well, yeah, well, that, that, that was complicated. <laughs> Anybody else have any questions? Did your parents come to terms with your being an artist? <laughs> it's really funny because. Well, my father had passed away when I was 10. And my mother, you know, she's got us all through college. And um, she's, and I said, you know, I, here I was a, an art major, I became an art major. And I knew I had to kill two more years because I wouldn't want to do with the art, right? So I thought, well, I'll get a graduate degree. I'll get, I can kill two more years. So I, I went to my mother. I said, you know, I think I want to get my master's. And she says, and I, you know, I said, I can't guarantee anything. And and she says, well, Patty, if you love something well enough, you'll do well in it. Oh, okay. she was, yeah, she was great. 
In uh, one piece, you talked about using faces of your friends. Uh -huh. But qu quite a few of the pieces, it seemed like I was looking at the same face. Not the group on the bridge, but some of your other oh, pieces. Yeah. So uh -huh. did you have it like a model? No, those I kind of made up. You know, I, I kind of, I don't know, I just kind of started modeling. Because they're about, you know, they vary in size from here to here, you know. They have various sizes. And um, I, uh, what I do is I model something out and then, like, um, well, to give you an example, I do a lot of slip casting. And the reason I, I started getting into that, in fact, a long time ago when I was in uh, undergraduate, they used to say, you know, you, you know those uh, uh, plaster molds that they used to find commercially? They used to say, that's not, that's not art. That's, you know, because old lady pe people use those and they're not this commercial. And so what happened is when I found out that I had, when I got this big commission, um, I, I found out, you know, when you start modeling like a little figure about that high, and I, I go to like, you know, like George Takao, and I say, okay, George, and I, I start um, modeling out his figure. Everybody has a different size figure. You know, there's old people, there's young people, there's skinny people, there's fat people, there's, you know, there's all kinds. I think I had six, six different body types for each male and female. And then, so what I did was I, I made these, so I made like 12 figures. But if you know anything about ceramics and you slip cast something and you try to bend it like, like in all the arms, like I, female arms, male arms, male legs, female legs. There's pants that have pants, some don't. So you have all this variation. And you also have positions like all these different arm positions, okay? leg positions, body positions. I think there's like six different body positions. Bend over this way, straight, lying down. And um, so when I started doing this commission, I noticed that when I start with the feet and work up the legs into the body and then the arms, the toes are already broken off, you know, because they dry out, you know, doing all this modeling. So I, had, I figured out that the only way I could do this project was to do all these body types, male, female, six different body types. And then also, if you slip cast something, if you pour it into a mold, the clay particles and the molecules, they line up like plates, like this. So if you try to, to slip cast an arm solid, like it, the arm's like, like your finger, right? You, you slip cast that, and you try to bend it, it will break because all the molecules are lined up. So I could, there's no way I could do that. So that meant that on arms, I had to do all these different positions, model them, and then take molds from everything. And also the legs, same thing, and body positions. So I had all these, <laughs> I had a way of uh, cataloging them, and I had, a, had bought, bought all these boxes, plastic boxes, and I had a whole, on this wall, boxes filled with the different body types and arms, right arm, men's right arm, fine leg. And, um, and then I would uh, have somebody come and slip cast everything for me. And then I'd go over and say, okay, there's George's body. I want him sitting down. <laughs> so I'd get the old man's body, pick it out, one that's sitting. And then i go pick out his right leg and his left leg. And then the heads, what I would do with the heads, I would make a ball the size about, you know, oh, prune size, and I'd model it out, look at my photographs, model it out, take it to Bob and say, who's that? Bob said, that's Betty Woodman. I said, no, that's George Takawa. <laughs> <laughs> then I'd have to go back and do it again, right? So until I got it right, until he could guess who it was. So th that's the way. And then I made molds from everything. I had hundreds of molds. And, um, and then once I got all the molds made, then I just slip cast everything and then stick them together. So from that particular period of time, I worked from molds. You may already know, but we're, we've been, uh, my wife and I have been pushing a little bit to make sure we have kilns in the new uh, oh. tower, which will be built here. Cool. Uh, we're related to that. Our son-in-law was uh, Scott from Scott Kilns. Oh, 
Oh, you're so, kidding. Yeah, right. Yeah, and oh, our, my God. Our, uh, our gra- I want to make sure our grandson, <laughs> who is majoring in art therapy, gets to see this some way or another. Oh. I think it's fantastic. So it's, oh, well, that's anyway, great. So that's we wonderful. That. <laughs> yeah, we're, we're <laughs> delighted with this. very <laughs> privileged to meet you. <laughs> I've used many of your kills. <laughs> ah, wonderful. So How about w- that? W- well, where's, the, where's your um, a factory? Uh, it's it? in Portland. Oh, okay. I kept thinking it was back east. No, there are a lot of a lot of Scott Kilns back east. We yeah. traveled back there and found a whole lot of them. So. Wow, wow, <laughs> right. that's great. Nice to meet you. Nice <laughs> <laughs> to meet you, too. <laughs> yes? Have you got any shows locally we could all go see? It's just went down. <laughs> uh, down at the Traver Gallery. Yeah, that's okay. <laughs> Hopefully I'll do another one. <laughs> Is that available, though? Um, I th- yeah, I think there, there's, yeah, there's some pieces left. But I meant the video that they made of the show, because that would be a wonderful way to visit current work. Oh, yeah, um, I think, yeah, they, you know, they did a video, but they didn't get the entire, they, it was an interview. They walked me around, but it wasn't long enough that they could get through it all. So, yeah, quite a bit. <laughs> yes? You are such a fantastic artist, and you are so prolific. I well, wondered if... I'm 83. Oh, <laughs> congratulations. That's wonderful. Um, I just wondered if assistants, you work with assistants? Yeah, I have uh, Dan. Um, Dan's worked for me for probably 27 years, 28 years. And Dan was teaching out at North Community College, and then he, um, in fact, uh, with Kate, Kate's here. Uh, was one of his students, and um, but Dan comes, you know, I thought, you know, when he applied for this job, I thought, oh, God, I'm going to lose him, you know, and uh, it, it turned out he, he would teach uh, out at the community college, and then he kept his job with me. He teaches, uh, he comes to my studio on Tuesday at 9.30 in the morning, and then he leaves about 4.30, 5.30, and then Jill, she's my, uh, Dan's my right brain, and Jill's my left brain. She comes Monday and Wednesday, comes from 9.30 to 4.30, and just works in my office with me, because I'm so, I'm terrible with, you know, all this technology and stuff. I can't even park my car. (laughs) Yes? I I wanted to go back to the beginning of your talk with Peter Volkus and the guy scene uh, that you mentioned uh, because I think ceramics and clay has often been a female practice, so then they were trying to make it macho. So how do you see it today? Oh, it's, I mean, you know, I'm not, I haven't taught for so long. Um, you know, I, I taught, I see, I taught 30 years altogether, and, and I think I quit about 20, 26 years ago. And, the, you know, I, so I don't keep up with what's really out there. You know, when I was teaching, I was really aware of all the things that people were doing. But now I've kind of cut myself off. But the things I do see now are pretty amazing. I mean, really amazing. I'm just blown away by the some of the stuff that's happening. And people are getting into technology. They're uh, extruding things. There's a, a, a an artist here in Seattle that's she's doing extrusions. And, you know, they're building houses that way now, too. But she's doing um, some clay work that way. But it's not even that. Uh, I think the imagery now has just gotten a lot, very exciting. Yeah, yeah I'm glad about teaching. Well, th- there's, <laughs> there's definitely a lot of large scale uh, ceramic sculptures these days, um, like Viola Frey. Oh, well, she, yeah, that Viola was way long time ago. She, she was. Uh, Who's talking? Oh, I'm sorry. That's okay. Um, yeah, well, Viola was lo- no Viola she was a lo- pioneer as a female. Yes, she was um, amazing. Um, she was about 19. Uh, no, she was early, very early. Yeah, and she, she was in uh, uh, Volkus's uh, studio. I mean, he had a big building, and uh, she had one of the studios in there. Yeah, she was great. Anybody else? Um, all these shots went by so quickly. I wish I could, you know, really stop and spend time on them the way I have over time. Uh, spent time with your moon bridge and all the people, and there's always captions, whether it's in the convention center, sort of hidden mostly in the convention center, um, or when it was in the opera house. But where is there any public art 
that we can walk to or, or find a way to besides this wonderful, is it a mermaid? That, it, uh, it, that with the... Uh, <laughs> the, the my brain. And that's in South Lake, uh, South Lake it's, Union. It's just so. down here, South Lake Union. Yes. Uh, I'm sorry? It's a Vulcan uh, project. Vulcan is South Lake Union. Mm -hmm. You know where Mercer mm -hmm. is? Mm -hmm. Well, it's on uh, West Lake, mm -hmm. and Mercer crosses it, right? Republicans, one block south. It's right there, mm -hmm. right on the corner. It's wonderful to just suddenly come upon it. <laughs> but <laughs> where else can we go and see something if we miss the Traverse Gallery? Um, a maiden bar over in Bellevue, the maiden bar oh, center, the, right. the oh. convention center. And uh, mm -hmm. I think there's uh, in Portland and see what else. Uh, uh, University Hospital, right. um, there's one. And I think Meany Hall has a piece. Oh. And uh, mm -hmm. uh, convention. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir? Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh oh, see, I'm going to join you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, anybody else have any questions? Well, I really appreciate you coming. Very, it was very kind of you to have me. Thank you.